this case is about lust, greed, and murder. One woman and two men. Both were very young men. Both wore a uniform. One was a police officer and one worked for the fire department. And they were both dead within 24 hours. The draw of the story, I think, was just the ultimate betrayal. The evidence is clear. Don't ever get away with murder. Oh my gosh. I mean, there's something screwy here. Lynn Womack was the kind of woman who turned heads. The 25-year-old was smart, sexy, and the life of the party. It's no wonder that police officer Glenn Turner fell head over heels in love when he first met her in a bar in Marietta, Georgia. But there was something else about Lynn. She turned more than one head at the same time, and it never ended well. was 100% a flirt. She was very pretty. She was very outgoing. She was considered attractive. And she liked attention. When she would come into a room, she wanted to be the, the main person there. Lynn enjoyed being around police officers. She was an employee of the Cobb County Police Department herself, working at 911 dispatch. But she appeared to be someone who just liked to hang around officers. And so that's who she was attracted to. That's how she got to meet Glenn. Glenn was a police officer. Lynn was a 911 operator. So they had that connection there also. And they both liked to party. Glenn was a big guy. He was over 200 pounds, over six foot tall. A great big old teddy bear kind of guy that you could just squeeze and just feel, feel at home and feel comfortable. So Lynn and Glenn's relationship seemed to start off very well, where she was showering him with gifts. Cowboy boots, clothes, alcohol, um, wheels for his truck. She would spend a lot of money on him and was very attentive. Lynn was very gung-ho about getting married and about being with him. The first time I met her is when they came home and told me they were getting married. When they did get married, Lynn still had the other lifestyle that she was used to, which was, you know, being flirtatious. And I don't think that he was ready to accept that fact. Lynn was more of a homey kind of guy. You know, let me be the, the husband that takes care of business, and then we can have our home together and eventually have children. But that's not the lifestyle that Lynn was looking for. The reality is that it was a tough marriage. Glenn had shared with some of his friends and co-workers that they were not being intimate with one another. Uh, they weren't even sleeping in the same bedroom. His focus went totally towards working. So it was definitely a strain. Lynn Turner was a spender. She was always in debt. She had a, a $1,000 cell phone bill every month which, you know, now to think is, is you know, kind of a crazy thing, but we're talking, you know, 20 years ago with roaming charges and whatnot, she would just spend money. I felt like, wow, you know, she done took my brother away from me. What happened to him? He's not the same person he used to be. They were struggling and, and Glenn talked about it and how unhappy he was and that he was moving toward getting a divorce. He was getting ready to move out. He was going to move to my dad's house. Several days later, Glenn started getting sick, really sick to his stomach. It went on. He thought it was some kind of stomach bug or something he'd eaten. He had nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. I talked to Glenn on the phone and asked him how he was doing. He's like, Linda, I'm so sick. He said, I feel like I'm going to die, which is a phrase that we always use. I'm like, well, man, I really hate to hear that. And he'd missed work all week, which is so unlike him. He never missed work. When he finally went to the hospital, they treated him with intravenous fluids because he was dehydrated, and they gave him some anti-nausea drug. And then he was released and went home. And Glenn's sister called him and asked him how he was doing, and he told her he was feeling better. 
And then within 24 hours, he was dead. I spoke to Lynn Friday evening after Glenn had passed that morning. She called me on her way traveling. She said she didn't know where she was going, but she wanted to call me and let me know what was going on. And she proceeded to tell me that Glenn was acting delirious, tried to drink gasoline that was down in the basement, that he had tried to jump off the back porch, which the back porch was way up high off the ground. But she never once said, I'll come by. Um, can I do anything to help you? The police came to the house, what Lynn told police at the time. Uh, she said she had, that he'd been feeling better. And she said he was sleeping that morning or something. And she said she went out to run some errands. She had made him something to eat. And when she got back, she found him dead in the bed. police took pictures of the basement and they took a picture of the gasoline can. The autopsy report said it was a natural death caused by enlarged heart and cardiac dysrhythmia, which is like an unusual or an irregular heartbeat. The police all came to his funeral because it was one of their own who had died and it was such a shock to everybody. And it was also, Lynn was one of their own. She was a 911 operator. So they were just sad. At the funeral, Lynn stayed away from me. I ran and gave her a hug and she was cold to me. It wasn't no surprise at the funeral that she had another guy on her arm. This guy happened to be married and have children. Mm -hmm. He was also a police officer, knew Glenn very well. And she had her hand all over his leg and, and talking to him all the time. And I was sitting there and looking at that, and I thought, what in the world is she doing over there with him? And her husband's in the casket, you know, ready to be going to the grave. It was hard to accept. Right after Glenn had died, um, you don't just jump into another man's arms. There was no mourning on her part. It started out great. They're madly in love. And then things got troublesome. Nope, today. Lynn Turner has just lost her husband, Glenn, to a death no one saw coming. But where most widows would take time to mourn, Lynn packs her bags and starts a new life. After Glenn died, Lynn Turner very quickly made some phone calls regarding the insurance. She was able to collect a $100,000 insurance policy. There was a $47,000 plus policy through the county that he had as a police officer. There was a small amount, a few thousand dollars in a bank account. At the end of the day, she, she walked away with about $150,000 and she also collected a, his pension. Right after Glenn had died, she put the house up and sold the house and she moved to Forsyth County and moved into an apartment with Randy. Randy Thompson was um, also in law enforcement. He was the sheriff's deputy when she first met him. And then he went on to become a firefighter. He was a enjoyable, lovable teddy bear sort of guy, somebody that you like to hang out with. Lynn, really in the course of her marriage to Glenn, at some point started an affair with Randy Thompson, who uh, she had met in Forsyth County, so it was a different county. As it turns out, it really preceded Glenn's death by about six months that she had actually already started seeing Randy Thompson was involved with his family, going to parties, going to family get-togethers. While Glenn was working a tremendous amount of hours doing his own job as an officer, working security jobs, working at a gas station, he was doing all the work and she was doing all the play. Lynn had met Randy Thompson up in Cumming, Georgia, which is Forsyth County, so it wasn't that far away, which is unusual that she was basically having a second life in nearby community but it was far enough away that it was different police agencies, different fire department. For the most part, different people that would never see her in one place or the other. There was a lot going on in her life, and I don't know how she was able to separate the two and have her husband laying there in the casket and still driving down to Randy's house 
that evening to, to have another life with him. Um, you don't just jump into another man's arms. Or I wouldn't think so anyway. You were having a little bit of a mourning time, but there was no mourning on her part. Um, so yeah, she moved on extremely quickly. When they first met Lynn, the Thompson family was told that by Lynn that she was divorced from her first husband, which of course was untrue. She was still married to Glenn and living with him actually, but she'd go back and forth between them. So it was, she, she was pulling off two lives. She also did the same thing with Randy that she did with Glenn, is buy him nice gifts. Expensive boots, expensive attire. Um, there were some World Series tickets involved at one point in time. There was a trip to the Daytona 500 and involved Randy and, and her. They didn't get married. She got pregnant, and he was going to ask her to marry him. Um, but they never did get married. And then she also had a second child by him. The relationship Lynn had with Randy was similar to the course of the relationship that she had had with Glenn, in that it started out great, you know, they're madly in love, and then things got troublesome. Randy's financial situation uh, was pretty tough. He uh, had some debt. He got into drinking. He may have tried to commit suicide. He took a bunch of pills, but he called his dad to say, I'm in trouble, I've taken these pills. And so he, his, his stability, he wasn't as stable a guy, perhaps, as Glenn had been. Randy got increasingly unhappy in the relationship with Lynn, and he finally moved out. He, he was ready to call it quits. Um, and he had two children, so I think that was a difficult thing for him, but he moved into an apartment, an upper-level apartment uh, of a two-story kind of apartment building. Randy Thompson had had a medical procedure in recent days. In fact, he had a, a shunt in his chest area to put antibiotics in to deal with that medical issue. But he started all of a sudden feeling ill. Again, flu-like symptoms. Lynn discovered that he had been feeling uh, poorly and began going to see him, spending time with him, bringing him uh, food to eat, uh, tea to drink, things of that nature. Lynn had even told some people that he had not been feeling well and was trying to get him to go to the hospital, but being the firefighter that he was, he just he thought he could handle it and fight it off and ultimately was not able to. Lynn discovered Randy in, in a bad state. He was in his underwear on his couch, and uh, uh, she reached out to 911 indicating that he was, uh, uh, was on the verge of death, was extremely ill and was very close to death, and they responded to... to to the home to check on him and ultimately uh, found him to be deceased. When Randy was evaluated by medical personnel, cause of death was thought to have been uh, some heart failure, something to do with, with some cardiac dysrhythmia, a heart failure, things of that nature. It was just minutes after uh, the funeral ended and they were going to the graveyard for the graveside service. Lynn made a call and found out that Randy had let his life insurance lapse. She was just livid because he had let his life insurance lapse. There was nothing to be paid and she did not get any money from his death. At the time, I was a reporter at the Atlanta Journal-Constitution. I had been tipped off about a situation involving police officers. He called them police officers. He said both men um, died of flu-like symptoms, and they both dated the same woman. It's just sort of a strange story. Each man got sick, really sick. Nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. Both were in their early 30s. Both were kind of robust, you know, uh, man, men's men type of, you know, cops, uh, first responder types. They both had a whirlwind relationship with Lynn Turner. She was showering them with gifts, giving them all sorts of things. 
their relationship seemed to be in turmoil at the end. They both were last seen with her, were last with her. And then they both had autopsies that, that had the same conclusions. Natural death caused by enlarged heart cardiac dysrhythmia. There's something screwy here. I did want to get to the truth of what occurred. Jane just started uh, working her sources. That's when I started thinking, is there some poison that this could have been? She was starting to find, you know, the pieces that put the two cases together. A woman and her one-year-old son found dead in a park. Now the child's father stands trial for their murders. An ex-Border Patrol agent's life hangs in the balance in this high-stakes death penalty trial. This dirt trail will tell a story. Baby Dominic was being hunted, but not by a creature, not by an animal, but by his own father. The Mistress and Child Murder Trial. Live coverage continues Wednesday morning at 8, 7 central on Court TV. Newspaper reporter Jane Hansen is determined to find out if it's more than just a coincidence that both of Lynn Turner's life partners have died in the same way. So she contacts the family of Lynn's first husband, Glenn. Glenn Turner's mother and the brother, James Turner, agreed to speak to me. They were both suspicious of Glenn's death um, primarily because Randy had just died and the deaths were six years apart and that's what made them even more suspicious. Both were very young men. Both wore a uniform. One was a police officer and one worked for the fire department. Uh, both were uh, uh, apparently healthy before they, they came down with this very serious illness. Both autopsies that I was able to obtain had exactly the same results. To have a natural death that is simply an enlarged heart and cardiac dysrhythmia, I just, it, it just jumped out at me. And then I furthermore learned that both of them had the exact same symptoms for three days before their deaths where they had intense nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, and they were both dead within 24 hours. When I got to Randy Thompson's family and I spoke to them and knew that they had never talked directly to the Turners, um, and they told me an identical story. It was like they used the same words. And one of the words they used was they called Lynn controlling. She was very controlling. And her patterns after their deaths were similar as well as described by the families. For the funeral, she chatted and had a good time and just very abnormal to anybody that is their spouse that's going to be buried, is sitting, laying up there in the casket. Subsequently, she cut off her relationships with each of the families. And I came back to the newsroom and said, oh my gosh, I mean, this is pretty incredible. I've got to keep going after this. I've got to look into this. That's when I started thinking, is there some poison that this could have been? And initially I was looking at like arsenic, but the symptoms weren't the same. And so I kept fiddling around with it. Jane uh, just started uh, working her sources. Any good reporter has sources, and you call them, you wheedle anything you can out of them, and she was starting to uh, find, uh, you know, the pieces that put the two cases together. By this time, the GBI was going back and looking at Randy's case, and I called the toxicologist. I asked him what poison would cause this. Can you tell me what what would actually cause these symptoms, these flu-like symptoms that both Randy and Glenn had? And he wouldn't say. And I said, well, let me ask you this. Off the record, are you all looking at ethylene glycol? Ethylene glycol, which is more commonly known as antifreeze. 
And he said, off the record, yes. The uh, GBI medical examiner did an autopsy on, on Randy and uh, they discovered what, what's called oxalate crystals in his kidney and liver area. And that's indicative of uh, poisoning by ethylene glycol. They concluded that Randy had been given a lethal dose of ethylene glycol or he had consumed a lethal dose and they changed the manner of death from natural to homicide which then led us to look back at Glenn Turner's death, and the medical examiner then decided the best way to determine for sure was to exhume the body, because the organs of the body are left within the body at, after the autopsy. When you bury a, a family member or anybody, you think that it's forever. That's done, you can move forward. You can try to grieve, you can go through all the motions of the anger, the, the missing them, the wanting them to be here. And then when they, you get the phone call that your brother's being exhumed, it's like ripping that scab off and you're restarting everything all over again. It's really a kick to the heart. It's like, really, how are you gonna live through this one more time? So they exhumed his body and sure enough, he had oxalate crystals in his body as well. They changed his manner of death as well from natural to homicide. So now they have two homicides and they know their link, their only common link is Lynn Turner. Lo and behold, they arrested her. Of course, the term black widow, you know, was kind of uh, cast over this story. It was kind of a classic case of, of greed. It was a national story and there was a lot of interest in it. The draw of the story, I think, was just the ultimate betrayal. We began the trial in Marietta, Georgia, but there was nothing easy about it. Any particular reason why you uh, took that photograph, sir? Uh, yes, sir, that, that uh, blue gallon bottle of uh, antifreeze there. Love watching free TV? Yes! There's a world of premium programming available right at your fingertips. All you need to do is rescan your television using a digital antenna. Then enjoy a lineup of 24 hour news and entertainment channels. I'm kind of loving this. To learn how to rescan your TV, visit the freetvproject.org. Lynn Womack Turner is branded by the press as the classic black widow, in love with the high life, but maybe not so much her lovers. Both her men died from antifreeze poisoning, yet the evidence that she has anything to do with it is only circumstantial. And that's not the only hurdle prosecutors face as the trial begins. Uh, Lynn had been accused of poisoning her first husband, Lynn Turner. In fact, that was the first case that was tried. It was tried before Randy Thompson's case. Lynn Womack Turner's case has generated hundreds of newspaper articles and televised reports. Attorneys on both sides and even the judge knew picking an impartial jury would be difficult, but no one knew it would be nearly impossible. We began the trial in Marietta, Georgia. The charge was just one count of malice murder, but there was nothing easy about it. There has been so much publicity over the Turner case in the last several years that of the 65 potential jurors, 62 of them say they have read or seen news reports on the case. 22 said they had formed a bias. Of those, 17 were dismissed. I had never had a case where we had started a trial and could not get a fair jury. We moved it down to Houston County, our middle Georgia. We'll begin stage one, opening statements. I'll call on the state of Georgia. Thank you, Your Honor. This case is about lust, greed, and murder. It's about one woman and two men. While this case is about the homicide of Glenn Turner, you're also going to hear about the homicide of Randy Thompson. 
I was comfortable in making the decision to let the facts and circumstances of the second murder come into our trial, which was the first murder. Randy Thompson also died from ethylene glycol poisoning. The evidence will show that there is one link, there is one thread, there is one common denominator, and it's this one, Julia Lynn Womack Turner. Starting the case out with those ideas of lust, greed, and murder, trying to set the tone for the jury to see that this was a, a lady who otherwise looked like a normal, uh, good-looking young lady who had decided that she wanted more than she could have, and she wanted both money and other men in her life, and ultimately she committed murder in order to obtain those. The defendant leaves the house on the morning of March the 3rd, and she later told the police that she was going out to run some errands. She returns home around 2 or 2.30 in the afternoon, and she finds Glenn in bed, dead. Four days <coughs> after Glenn's funeral, Glenn Turner moved into an apartment in Cumming with Randy Thompson. We learned that six years after Glenn Turner died, Randy Thompson died, and in a very similar way. The only thing that connected them was Lynn Turner. On Sunday, Randy's sick all day, but he's visited by the defendant Monday. Randy is discovered dead by fireman friends sometime around mid-morning. We'll ask that you return a verdict. Guilty of the offense of murder of Maurice Glenn Turner. Thank you very much for your attention. I'll call on uh, the defense team, and they may now present their opening statement. Thank you, Judge. <clears throat> Uh, my name is Vic Reynolds. Uh, Mr. Barry and I practice law together up in Marietta, Georgia. We represent Lynn Turner. I represented uh, Lynn Turner along with my partner, Jimmy Barry. Once, once we learned in this case that evidence of both of these transactions were going to be admitted, then, then you realize this is going to be a tough road to climb. Uh, and in fact, I remember sitting down with Lynn telling her that you're, you're in trouble. You're in trouble. His Honor told you yesterday that serving on a jury is a tremendous honor. When everything is done, we're gonna stand back in front of you, look you directly in the eyes we're doing now, and ask you to exercise that tremendous responsibility by finding Lynn Turner not guilty. Trying to explain how somebody would use antifreeze as a poisoning was not an easy thing, but it was so unique that for two people who had no other common denominator other than Lynn Turner, and their death by antifreeze, she was the one who had to have administered it. And on your second conversation with Ms. Turner, uh, can you tell us and relate to us what she told you? Yes, sir. I, I, I'd asked her about the the, uh, the gasoline and that uh, um, Judy said that uh, earlier that morning that Glenn had woken up, that he had been hallucinating. And they tried to jump off the second story balcony thinking that he could fly. And that uh, he had went downstairs to try to bring some gasoline because uh, he was thirsty. One of the things that was a big gotcha in the case was that Lynn had said her husband had gone in the basement and was trying to drink gasoline. And it seemed like a very strange thing. The police were on the scene of the death, they took some pictures, and they took a picture of the gasoline can. Any particular reason why you uh, took that photograph, sir? Yes, because I went down there to see if uh, the gasoline can, to, you know, see if it was open and see if it had, some maybe had spilled out on the floor or something. Did you uh, notice any other items that appear in that photograph, sir? Uh, yes, sir, that, uh, that uh, blue uh, gallon uh, bottle of uh, antifreeze there. And boom, there it was. They blew it up and, and showed it to the jury, showed that she had the antifreeze, the, the, she had the means to, to do the killing. Now, you had gotten information from Lynn that um, Lynn had eaten some jello that morning. Did not? 
Yes. So we were trying to explain to the jury how could she have gotten the antifreeze into Glenn Turner? Because at the end of the day, we did not have actual evidence to say, here's where the antifreeze was. We pondered as prosecutors trying to figure out what are all the different ways you could hide this so that someone would take it unwittingly. And so Jell-O was one of those things. Antifreeze is sweet tasting, but it doesn't have any other taste. It just has a sweetness to it, and it's odorless. And it doesn't require much to get a lethal dose of it. We bought some uh, lime Jell-O, mixed it with the appropriate amount of water, and then added to that 33 cc's of antifreeze. Frankly, the question was, can Jell-O even congeal with antifreeze in it? And so we made some, and sure enough, it worked. The photograph is taken from above, and you can see that the Jell-O set up the way you would anticipate Jell-O setting up, and half of the Jell-O has been removed, and you can see that the Jell-O still has its gelatinous appearance. It's not liquidy. It doesn't uh, flow. It looks like Jell-O. Another thing I had not known myself until it came out in trial, and I thought it was extremely damaging against Lynn. They found out that she had visited the local animal shelter and asked the question, how do you euthanize animals? When you arrived, did you see Lynn? She was crying hysterically, and I grabbed her arms and I shook her, and I says, Lynn, what is wrong, honey? Tell me, what is wrong? If Lynn Turner is smart, smart enough to almost get away with a murder for six and a half years, why wouldn't she smart enough to cremate Lynn's body? These are the cases that captivated the world. Can keep my life straight. That demanded our attention. They were killed by their own children. That challenged the legal system and ourselves. How in the world can a mother wait 30 days for reporting her child missing? These are the trials that became legendary. Don't play! I and now you can relive them all in one place. Court TV Legendary Trials. Go to courttv.com slash legendary trials to find out how to watch. The prosecution has shown that it would be possible for Lynn Turner to poison her husband Glenn using jello laced with antifreeze. And there was a container of antifreeze in Lynn's basement at the time of Glenn's death. Did she actually use it? Well, the jury is about to hear bombshell testimony that Lynn was awfully interested and how to take a life. Lynn had visited the um, local animal shelter to find out how, and asked the question, how do you euthanize animals? And did Ms. Turner ask you any inquiry about how uh, your shelter euthanized animals? Yeah, at that point, she wanted to know how the euthanasia process worked. <laughs> I explained it to her, that it was an injection that we gave the animals, and that, um, they didn't really feel any pain. Did you tell her what the substance was that you used to flare the shelter? She asked me what did we use, and I told her I, I didn't know the name of it. We just called it purple stuff. Anytime that we had an animal to euthanize, we asked for enough purple stuff to dispose of the animal that we had. And she had asked me, could anybody get it? Was it easy to get a hold of? And I, I told her no. It was a controlled substance, and that even us as a licensed clinic had trouble getting it at times because of the amounts that we used. That was something that Lynn was sort of looking into. Um, this would have been prior to Glenn's death. We had a discussion about a stray cat problem she was having in her neighborhood at the time. And did she make any inquiry concerning uh, antifreeze? She asked, did, um, as she was talking about the stray cat problem, she asked, did antifreeze have the same effect on cats as it did on dogs? And I, I told her that, yes, in fact, it did have the same effect. I always thought it was ironic that she chose law enforcement personnel to be her targets. She chose to do those things, which certainly would put her in danger, one would think, that, hey, they've got investigators. They're going to look into this. That's going to be a problem. And maybe that played into why the antifreeze was used, because it was such an unusual mechanism that maybe it wouldn't be looked for or maybe it wouldn't be caught. Lynn Turner's legal team brought rows of family and friends to court to prove she has support. Would you tell the ladies and gentlemen of the jury who you are and spell your last name for the record? I'm Helen Gregory. I'm Lynn Turner's mother. The strength of the state's case was so 
great that it left us with basically uh, the, the only choice was to put character witnesses up. Did you obviously know Glenn Turner? Glenn? Oh, yes. He's, he's my son-in-law. Did uh, he and your family get along pretty well? Yes, sir. How did you learn that Glenn had passed away? I got a telephone call to come to her house. I immediately left the office and went to her house. When you arrived, did you see Liam? Uh, yes, sir. <clears throat> did you go to her and speak I went with? immediately to her. She was crying hysterically, and I asked her what was wrong, and uh, she didn't respond, and I grabbed her. She had her arms up, and I grabbed her arms, and I shook her, and I says, Lynn, what is wrong, honey? Tell me what is wrong. And she just said, he's dead, and that's all, and all she ever got out. She was hysterical. And we felt in this case that it was certainly very important for the jury to see Lynn's mother's relationship with her, how much she loved her. You know uh, that it's reported that Randall Thompson died because of ethylene glycol poison. I've been, I've read it and I've heard it, but I don't believe it. And the truth is you're, you're hoping to to touch a sympathetic chord or note with somebody sitting in that jury box when you put that kind of evidence up. Is it ask yourself these questions when you're back there deliberating. Is Lynn Turner smart? Smart enough to almost get away with a murder for six and a half years? Smart enough to plan another one? Why wouldn't she smart enough to cremate Lynn's body? Is she so doggone smart? Why don't she increase Glenn's insurance? Increase it right after the marriage and let it sit there for a while. And why in the Sam Hill with the woman poison Glenn with antifreeze and leave it in the basement? You can't have it both ways. Is she that shrewd and conniving and scheming on one hand and stupid on the other hand? The defense of this case was a struggle. Uh, to, to try to find some reason to try to give the jury a way to say, you know what, there is a doubt here. I think there's a, a reasonable doubt. I'm going to let her go. Do you have a doubt based on a reason? Do you have a doubt based on a reason? Because if you do, I believe the judge would tell you, you have to acquit I think that the defense uh, was able to, to give a, a, a sense of some reasonable doubt. You know, that all you need to do is, is win over one juror. You, you put reasonable doubt in one juror's mind and you hang the jury. I've tried a lot of jury trials and so you, you sometimes are surprised with what a jury does. The evidence is clear. Don't let her get a little bit The defense had done a pretty good job at raising reasonable doubt if Lynn Turner did kill her husband, Glenn. But Glenn's sister, Linda, is nowhere near convinced. What are the odds that this could occur? That you've got two men, both in their early 30s, both of them die of ethylene glycol toxicity, <clears throat> and she is the element with both. You have a better chance of winning the lottery tonight. In conclusion, I'd like to read to you a poem. The prosecution read a poem called The Poisoner in uh, Georgia, in. Um, Closing argument, you you certainly have some leeway. The Borgias, the Medici's, and all those past, you may have thought you had seen the last, but we poisoners are still around today, and if you miss my crime, I'll get away. The poisoner poem was trying to create a verbal image for the jury. Uh, this is what a poisoner does. They hope that they can get away with it by sliding something in that no one would notice. The knowledge gained by my living close made it so very easy to deliver the dose. I'm a different kind of killer, as you can see. I'm a poisoner. Can you catch me? Was the poem dramatic? Yes. As far as the judge, <laughs> did I love it? No. Julia Lynn Womack Turner. Murder, Glenn Turner. 
The evidence is clear. Don't ever get away with murder. Thank you. I've tried a lot of jury trials, oh, oh, probably 120, 130 jury trials. And so you, you sometimes are surprised with what a jury does. When the verdict finally came down, we were all lined up in a row there with the Thompson family. And I remember the judge saying very clearly, Judge Botterford, I don't want any outbursts, I don't want any emotion, then we'll have to throw you out of the court. And I'm like, oh wow, he's being serious. Bring in our jury, please. We, the jury, find the defendant, Julia Lynn Womack Turner, guilty of malice murder as alleged in count one of the indictment. So rendered this 14th day of May, 2004. I watched Lynn and she just very sort of uh, matter of factly took off her earring. She had been out on bond up to that time and she knew that she couldn't have those in custody. And uh, she walked out with the sheriff's deputies. Uh, that was the last time that she ever saw uh, the outside world. In Georgia, if you're convicted of murder, uh, you get an automatic life sentence. So she got the life sentence. In the second case involving Randy Thompson's death, they went for the death penalty in that case. That was a high stakes trial. And as a reporter, I felt like I didn't want to have anything to do with sending somebody to their death. Turner never showed much emotion during the trial, but now in handcuffs, she wiped tears as her mother testified. I feel that these children have gone through enough and that wouldn't accomplish anything by putting her to death. We, the jury, have found beyond a reasonable doubt that one or more of the alleged statutory aggravating circumstances do exist to fix a sentence at life imprisonment without parole. In the second case, she was sentenced to life without parole, which you never are going to leave prison. I was so angry. My mom kept telling me, you've got to forgive her. I'm like, no, I can't. No, you've got to forgive her. You can't have hate in your heart. It took several years, and finally, I was able to say, okay, she's forgiven. I don't want to sit down and eat dinner with her, but no. I've forgiven her. I was working at the Georgia Supreme Court, and I got a phone call from one person at the GBI, and he said, Jane, are you sitting down? And I said, yes, and he said, they just found Lynn Turner dead in her prison cell. It was ruled to be a suicide. It was the first time that I was ever aware that Lynn Turner gave up and didn't try to find someone else to do what she wanted to have done for her own good. She had committed suicide by hoarding medication that she had and then took them all at once and succeeded in killing herself. My mama showed me how to, to forgive and I'm glad that I was able to before she passed away. Ironically, Lynn Turner ended her life as she did others. Her own kind of poison she ingested so that she would overdose. Had she not poisoned her second lover in the exact same way as the first, she might have gotten away with all of it. In the end, her poison wasn't really chemical. It was greed. I'm Tamron Hall. Thanks for watching. Someone they knew.